Hello, I'm Imran Garda, filling in for Derek Ashong. You're in the stream, a social online community with its very own TV show. And this is it. We're bringing you the stories that are ongoing, global, and sourced from social media. Today, Egyptians are talking about the role of Islam in their country's future. And they're doing it in 140 characters. And bloggers declare an end to sexual harassment. But is anyone listening? Our digital producer Ahmed Shihabuddin is here as always tracking your feedback and uh, also next to him joining us on the couch is Natasha Fatah, a, a journalist and a, a columnist who focuses on uh, minority communities. Natasha, give us a taste as to what your column is about and the work you do in, in general. My purpose is to sort of shed light on minority communities, be they ethnic, religious or economic, in the Western world and how international stories connect with them. And of course, social media has revolutionized the way we communicate with one another. It's made the world a very small place. So I kind of talk about that in my column as There's well. There's going to be a lot of convergence uh, uh, between uh, social networking, what you're mentioning, and of course, a lot of the issues that you're passionate about yes. during this program. So we look forward to hearing your thoughts along with our other guests throughout the duration of the program. Well, since Egypt's popular uprising, many have wondered what role, if any, religion should play in the country's future. It's a fairly complicated and difficult discussion to have under any circumstance, but one group of young Egyptians is trying to do it in 140 characters. Have a look. This is their poster. It's called the Tweet Nadwa, and it's got the hashtag Tweet Nadwa, which uh, actually means tweet gathering or, or symposium. And online organizers invited activists to have the same frank discussions they're already having via Twitter in a public forum. And it was a success. Hundreds turned out to discuss the role of Islam. Many others tweeted into the meeting. Well, to include a multitude of voices, the rules were that the attendees were limited to 140 seconds for their comments. Well, earlier we spoke with Tweet Nadwa organizer Ala Abdel Fattah about the idea behind this kind of conversation. And let's have a listen to what and he I had remember, to say. And I remember, you know, um, facilitating or organizing many of these discussion circles during the sitting. So I thought, let's try and do something that mixes both um, um, feelings, you know, get the Twitter community to participate in an offline discussion that is inspired by the um, discussion circles that we have in Tahrir Square. And that's it. So let's start with the independent Islamist. Well, this is basically taking Tahrir to the next square. Sorry, the line was a bit sketchy there, but uh, Al Abdel Fattah talking uh, generally about why this was so necessary for him and for, for all of those involved in Egypt's revolution and the next step uh, forward. Well, the views expressed in that first tweet, Nadwa, were quite wide-ranging, and they included those who fear the Muslim Brotherhood. Others argued that Islam is a system that encompasses everything. Well, joining us now via Skype from Cairo to discuss this is Ibrahim al Hudaybi. He's a columnist and featured speaker at the first tweet, Nadwa. He's also a former member of Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood. Ibrahim, uh, great pleasure to have you uh, with us. Why do you think the tweet Nadwa was so necessary and vital at this moment in Egypt's history. Um, first of all, I think it's, uh, it's, it's useful because we, we got the chance to talk to each other, to listen to each other, and a lot of jargon was left behind because of the 140 seconds thing. So that meant that you had to make a point and uh, to make a point which is either a response to another, uh, 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 another person's point or... Uh... Okay, unfortunately, Ibrahim, we have a bit of a problem with the line there with uh, Ibrahim. It's a bit uh, stop-start. We're going to try and get him back. Uh, he spoke about how important it was to actually start this uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you, Ahmed, I mean, you spent a fair amount of your upbringing in Egypt, right. you followed the revolution closely, mm. and the post-revolution Egypt. Um, the honeymoon period is over now. Egyptians have to get together now and discuss mm. what's going to work for the interests of all uh, Egyptians. How central is the discussion over Islamism and the Muslim Brotherhood 
to taking the country forward? It's a great question. I think it's a question that was definitely addressed at this tweet, Nadwa. I spoke to Ala, who's one of the young activists that's been involved in this. And I think, you know, before we start looking at this, it's important to note that 70% of Egypt's population is under the age of 29. So the future really lies, you know, in their hands. And uh, when I spoke to her and others, I mean, Ala, forgive me, and others, they really highlighted the role in which the youth is kind of straying away from the Muslim Brotherhood's elder kind of elite leadership in the sense that they are much more concerned, or at least segments of, the, of that group, you know, are much more concerned with unemployment, which plagues 80% of this population that's under the age of 29, than, you know, perhaps uh, using Sharia law as a foundation for any political system. So there's a lot of debates, and, you know, of course, in the West as well, and even online, you know, for example, one tweet that just came in before we even got to have Ibrahim there, the, from H. Loskuwak, is saying the world needs a strong separation of politics and religion. So as to whether this will actually uh, happen in Egypt, if we'll see a secular future or maybe one based in Sharia law, is still to be debated. Well, I, I yeah. think the concern for many is that when Egypt was sort of erupting and this incredible movement was taking place, it sort of came from the grassroots. It didn't come from the Muslim Brotherhood. Most analysts would agree that the Brotherhood wasn't involved in that. And you had so many young people, as, as you mentioned, there saying, we want democracy, we want equal rights for women, we want the lifestyle and the, the equality that's available in the West. We do want that mm -hmm. here. We don't want to be suppressed under a dictatorship anymore. But the problem became that no one wanted to be the voice of that movement. Even Wael, who worked for Google, who was arrested, you know, the Western media had sort of propped him up as being mm -hmm. the leader. He said, no, 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 I don't want to speak on behalf of this entire movement. So, and while that's very noble and romantic, what it ended up doing is creating this huge vacuum that someone eventually would have to fill. Right. And now that the movement has stopped and the elections will come, it looks like the Brotherhood is going to step in, which is a point that worries a lot of secularists in Egypt well, right. uh, and, and outside Ahmed, Egypt. Yeah. The fact that the Brotherhood kept a low profile right. during yeah. the Egyptian revolution in in, in some obscure way even made people fear them more because they felt there's some sort of strategy right. at play here. Give us some insight into that thinking. Yeah, you know, what happened is, you know, for, for example, in the first, you know, uh, you know, Tahrir movement, we saw that a lot of the Muslim Brotherhood leaders were there, but in the second one, when people continued to want to demand these kinds of, you know, changes, they really urged that the youth did not go and participate in this. And what we saw, as, a, as I said again, is that the youth started to move away from this. And the Muslim Brotherhood's been positioning themselves to have, you know, a majority and have influence in the future of Egypt's governing, but not to be held accountable, perhaps, because they're not really vying for, at least formally, the presidential elections. They're merely saying that they want to be active. And I think Ibrahim, also, when we spoke to him earlier, mm. suggested that they have two choices. Either they widen their groups and try and, you know, have uh, partnerships and alliances with groups like the Weft Party, which uh, they already, in the past week, have already mm. started to, you know, align themselves with this liberal group called the Weft Party, or they, you know, retreat into their uh, underline, which is, you know, uh, really being not extremist, but let's say conservative and not really being inclusive. Um, a lot of people are worried as to what this all might mean. I mean, one tweet we have on this issue coming in from Anne Slayton is that they have a wide support base, which is, you know, he's referring to the Muslim Brotherhood, but they really have no plan. And that's what's worrying a lot of people is, you know, they've created this uh, party the Justice and uh, Freedom Party. You know, many people say that it's mirrored after the Turkish Party, the yeah. Justice and Development Party. So the question is, as, as an, and Slayton's saying, if anything, he's saying, be afraid if they take power and stall the government, meaning mm -hmm. that they're positioning themselves, claiming they don't want to come into power, they just want to have participatory role, and then perhaps many people are worried that once they do have that role, they will continue to eventually uh, dominate the, uh, the political sphere in Egypt. I mean, even this diversification idea of splintering off into different parties, that doesn't actually address the thing because it's kind of like communist Europe. You have five or six different parties, mm -hmm. where, but if they're all basically communist or socialist, mm -hmm. or if they're all sort of Islamist mm -hmm. or conservative, you can call the parties whatever you want, but if the underlying agenda is for an Islamist state, we don't know that for certain yet, mm -hmm. but if that's what we're driving towards, no. it doesn't really alleviate the concerns for many people. Well, well, something that I noticed from sampling some of those tweets from the tweet, Nadwa, and just in general, I'm mm -hmm. quite a newbie to Twitter, but in, in general, on social networking, Facebook, etc., you had mm -hmm. a lot of young Egyptians who identify themselves as practicing Muslims, Islamists of, of some uh, form. Mm -hmm. However, they felt insulted that people pigeonholed them mm -hmm. as 
uh, Muslim Brotherhood, Salafis or hardliners, mm -hmm. and then there's the sort of cartoon guilt by association mm -hmm. that, that goes on in the West. So, for example, one of the ideologues of the Muslim Brotherhood was Sayyid Qutb and Osama bin Laden mm -hmm. read Sayyid Qutb, mm -hmm. so everybody who's attached to the Brotherhood supports Osama bin Laden. I find uh, there's a lot of this kind of fighting back via uh, social media in terms of how they are perceived by the outside world. Uh, would you, you know, care to comment on that? Do you think that that is a, a positive trend? Because I, I certainly see it as one. It, it's something that definitely needs to be discussed further because there is a distinction between an Islamist and a Muslim, at least for me. You can be as conservative or as hardline as you want in your private life and you're practicing Muslim. But if you're an Islamist, that's a political agenda, and that's the problem for many people with the Muslim Brotherhood. It's an Islamist agenda where you want the implementation of Sharia law. You don't see men and women as equal citizens. There are no protections for Coptic Christians and other minority groups. So if you're a practicing Muslim, that's nobody's business. That's your private life. But you're, if you're an Islamist, that is potentially mm -hmm. a point of concern because you want to affect the public sphere through politics. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd like to get... Ahmed's view on this because Ahmed again your finger is is on the pulse of, of mm -hmm. the Egyptian street you're you're closer to those diverse views from within Egypt mm -hmm. as far as Natasha's point is right you have Egyptians saying yes I'm an Islamist yeah. Islamist but that doesn't mean I'm against the rights of minorities right. of Copts of women Precisely. and that there are different ways of interpreting what an Islamist means right. is this tweet Nadwa and the other developments that we're seeing opening the door to having those discussions, to seeing the, the, the varying shades of Islamism even. I think what it does, as you said, is it really introduces a lot of nuances and a nuanced perspective, which, again, I don't mean to focus on the youth, but it's important to because a lot of them, you know, they said in the first tweet, Nadwa, that they felt disillusioned with the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood for the sole purpose and reason being that the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't accommodate their questioning and their nuanced opinions. You know, being an Islamist doesn't necessarily that you have to have one hard line vantage point or perspective. And this tweet actually, uh, Baz Ramit is saying, the Muslim Brotherhood seems more interested in speeding up the election time than calling the military's human rights abuses mm -hmm. and democratic violations. And it's important to note that the Muslim Brotherhood is the most well organized group, political group in Egypt, despite having been banned for decades under Mubarak. And so for them, with the parliamentary elections coming in September, they want to just move things along so that they can, you know, prevent other groups who might exactly. be able to accommodate some of the concerns of the youth where they have a more balanced or more nuanced uh, take on, you know, their conservative uh, standpoint. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting that this is a point that we've been hearing at the tweet, Nadwa, mm -hmm. but also uh, from the actual leadership themselves. Good news, Ibrahim is back. We have uh, a clear stream to him. Uh, excuse the pun. Ibrahim, welcome back. I hope uh, this time it will last. I hope the internet connection is decent enough. We've spoken a little bit about Hello. the Ikhwan. Uh, yeah, we've spoken a little bit about the, the Ikhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and its role and its definition. Um, I suppose, let me start off with a nexus of the fear from the outside, from many who fear the Muslim Brotherhood and who fear Islamism in general. The, the theory goes that the Muslim Brotherhood, even if it participates in democratic elections, will only use democracy as a ladder to climb up to theocracy, and then they'll kick away the ladder for nobody else to climb up again. Is that fear relevant to the Egyptian experience today? I don't think it is. I don't think. I think um, uh, I believe in the people. I believe in the people of this country who were able to oust Mubarak after 30 years in power. No one else can come to power and just hold on to it against the will of the people. I mean, this is not this is not even a, uh, something that I could perceive in any in any positive way. Uh, and I just like to uh, I just like to comment on something else that has, that has been just been said. Uh, the the uh, idea of Sharia being uh, a threat to minority rights or to women's rights and women not being equal and so forth. I know that uh, in fact there are some interpretations of Sharia uh, that uh, discourage equality and that discourage. Uh, I mean, don't give equal citizenship rights to minorities and so forth. But we have also to understand that uh, the, the political spectrum, it's, it's a continuum, and the, the Islamist spectrum is continuum. And while um, not only all Islamists, but the vast majority of Egyptians, over 90% of Egyptians, uh, endorse the notion of Sharia, 
57% of Egyptians, according to a Gallup statistic, view religion as being important in their lives, and even in their public lives. Over 70% of Egyptians want to see an advisory role for religious scholars in, in, in political affairs. But that doesn't mean that they don't want equality. And that doesn't mean that they don't want equal citizenship rights. They don't want women rights and so forth, because there are different interpretations of, uh, of Sharia. And John Esposito and Daria Mujahid in the book, uh, Who Speaks for Islam, make a very, uh, I mean, very insightful statement when they say Sharia means different things for different Muslims. And uh, it, is, it is always important to make this distinction between uh, Sharia and what uh, a, a particular Islamist movement wants, because uh, that's, that's the problem with the secular liberal elite in the country, because when they challenge uh, Islamists, because they, they challenge the very notion of Sharia, ah and not only the political program presented by a particular Islamist movement, they, they, that leads to resistance from the society, which is a predominantly religious society that would not accept the challenge of its foundational pillars. Okay, let's get Natasha's comment on this, because she was quite passionate about this. Ibrahim saying that even the call for Sharia ah and mm -hmm. even uh, the, the aspiration for Sharia to be involved in, in, in political life is not a monolith. Right. It depends on, on, on interpretation and therefore Islamism can't be seen as a, as a monolith. Mm -hmm. that's, that's perfectly fine. And Ibrahim, the people who ousted Mubarak also said clearly that they weren't fighting on behalf of Islam. They wanted democracy again and again. People said they wanted dis democracy. But let's say for the sake of argument, you're correct and people want Sharia law. Who's going to decide what kind of Sharia law? If you're saying there's a wide okay. spectrum, the, be the beauty of yeah. democracy is you vote. Okay, How, Ibrahim. Who decides? Okay, Natasha, let's get Ibrahim's response I to totally, that. Ibrahim. I totally agree with you. I mean, I'm 100% I'm in agreement with you on that. And uh, people didn't ask for Sharia, uh, but, but we also have, I mean, lots of statistics that say that the vast majority of Egyptians want the people because Sharia is not this monolithic body. Uh, I mean, the Egyptian state, the, 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 the former regime, did not violate Sharia in any way, by the way. Did not violate Sharia except in matters of human rights and so forth. But its legislation was not anti-Sharia. And this is the, the, this, the most serious problems here are that, uh, I mean, the endorsement of the Saudi model or the Iranian model when it comes to civil rights and so forth causes lots of fear. And I, as an Egyptian citizen, wouldn't like to live in a, in a context like that by any Okay, unfortunately, we've lost Ibrahim again. Ibrahim, if you can hear me, uh, we sincerely thank you. It's a great pity that we didn't uh, have you for the full 10 minutes or so that we wanted you for, but uh, you, we did get the gist of Ibrahim's message there. Fascinating uh, discussion. The next uh, tweet, Nadwa, is on the 21st. That's tomorrow on Tuesday. No doubt uh, these issues will be cooked up again and, and fleshed out by Egyptians themselves, so we'll be... Uh, following that as well on the stream. You can f find out more details about the tweet, uh, Nadwa, on our website, stream.aljazeera.com. There it is, the hashtag tweet Nadwa takes on the role of the Muslim Brotherhood. Next one is tomorrow. And you can also find an opinion piece by our very own Ahmed Shihabuddin, as uh, well as uh, many more stories. Ahmed. Uh, you know, it's a shame, as you said, we weren't able to get his opinions because there were many questions coming in on Twitter, but maybe we'll tweet them to him and, and he'll respond there. Now, if you're new to social media, what makes it so powerful is the ability to follow what's being said about a story anywhere in the world and in real time. And the key to all this is the Twitter hashtag. So we'll be sharing a few of the stories you're following, but first, here's how Twitter hashtags work. So if you want to give it a try, put a hashtag that interests you into Twitter's search box and you can follow everything that's tweeted on that topic. Try it out. Here's some hashtags your fellow viewers are following in the stream.
Thanks for that, Ahmed. Now, sexual harassment is intimidation, bullying, or coercion of a sexual nature, and its impact can be devastating. Let's have a look at this. Okay, that's a slightly a humorous look at that. That's Salwa uh, giving her pervert chauvinist boss a, a good old slap for trying to give her I think promotion. that guy interviewed me once. <laughs> he looks very familiar. <laughs> yeah, kind of sleazy. <laughs> uh, right. um, but uh, no men like that exist in this building, I, no, I, no, I promise not. you. Well, it's an age-old phenomenon, and of course it occurs in every culture. But can that type of transparency and crowdsourcing social media offers bring greater awareness and actually help stem harassment. Let's uh, give you an example of what's being done over here. This is uh, June the 20th to-do list and uh, it's from Egypt to Lebanon. Uh, I'll be blogging against sexual harassment, sharing video stories, poetry, films, and that's on the 20th. That's the goal of anti-harassment campaigners in Lebanon and Egypt. They're organizing around the hashtag EndSH for End Sexual Harassment and they've declared June the 20th a day of blogging and tweeting against sexual violence. Well, joining us now via Skype from Beirut to discuss this is Alex Shems. He's the creator of Resist Harassment Lebanon website. Alex, uh, welcome to the stream. Uh, you're a man in Beirut. Um, why is this so important to you? Why is it so relevant to you? Um, well, I mean, I think it's, it's a problem that we're encountering throughout society, and it's, it's not something that's being discussed. I mean, personally, I wasn't aware of it, and then I began to talk to many of my friends who are women, and hearing about how prevalent it was and how much it was disrupting their daily lives really made me uh, interested in the issue and interested in sharing it. So, and that's sort of why we started to create the blog. Alex, I'm really struggling to hear you absolutely clearly. I did get, uh, you know, the, the gist of what you had to say. Uh, hopefully the line improves a little bit better. Uh, one, of, one of my main questions is, is this something that is a specific problem to Beirut or to Cairo, to Lebanon and Egypt in general? Or is there not an argument to say, yes, men have a tendency to act like pigs the world over in a very chauvinistic, uh, patronizing way? Uh, is there something that makes it any worse or any different in these particular places? Well, in our activism, we try not to, to pathologize sexual harassment as something specific to the Middle East or specific to Beirut, but to look at it as a symptom of uh, patriarchy, of male dominance in society, which occurs the world over. Um, however, the ways in which patriarchy manifests itself in every society is different. So, for example, in Beirut and in Cairo, it seems that patriarchy more often manifests itself in an attempt to, to deny women the right to the public sphere. Okay. And this is why we see harassment as, as, a, as a major issue. Okay, Natasha wants to come in here quickly. Yeah, Alex, we know the vast majority of women have expressed that they've been sexually harassed in some way or the other, but the men who admit that they've done the sexual harassment, what do they say? What, how do they perceive their behavior? I mean, often, unfortunately, it seems that for many men, it's, it's something funny, it's a joke, and they don't take it seriously. So even men, for example, who don't harass women uh, will often tend to think that women are exaggerating or that when women talk about the issue, it's not something serious or something that actually impedes their ability to lead their daily lives, which is definitely one of the main reasons which we set up the blog, is to have a space first for women to be able to talk about the issue and to share their experiences and to share how they're okay. resisting harassment. Okay. Alex, we're struggling um, to hear you and we have to cut you off because we're running out of time. But stay where you are because we do have a post show that takes place online. Alex, thanks a lot. Natasha, Ahmed, thank you very much. Stay with us for the post show. You can learn more about that campaign against sexual harassment in Egypt and Lebanon and elsewhere and continue this conversation by joining us in the post show by going to stream.aljazeera.com. If you're on the TV show, we'll see you next time.
Welcome back. You're watching The Post Show with me, Imran Garda, sitting in for Derek Ashong. Ahmed Shehabuddin is with us. Natasha Fatah is with us as well. We're struggling to hear Alex. We'll try and, you know, get him back uh, again. Natasha, I, I could see you, you know, uh, perk your body <laughs> up and, uh, and get ready uh, to discuss this for five hours, if you could. Um, it's a controversial issue. Mm -hmm. It's an issue that's not going to be wrapped up in a three-minute mm -hmm. discussion at the end of a TV show. However, do you think that it's encouraging that a campaign of sorts has kicked off in Lebanon and Egypt? Absolutely. I think this is an issue that definitely needs to be addressed. And I'm so glad it's a person named Alex, a guy who started this. Yeah. That when I read about the story, I, I was ready for, for you know, you know, Nosheen or Jamila or someone to have started it, but someone named Alex, and I'm so impressed. And I think it takes a lot of guts. Yeah. And he was very specific to say this isn't a problem within the Middle East, and he's absolutely right about that. But there are social mores and norms that allow behavior to go unchecked right. in certain parts of the world versus others. So, you know, as I mentioned in the pre-show, mm. I lived in Saudi Arabia for 10 years. I was a young girl, but you couldn't get through a day without someone yelling, Habibi, Habibi, you know, to yeah, like but I mean, a I, little I grew up in South Africa and I've you know, spent time in, in the quote-unquote West. Are yeah. you saying that men are more chauvinistic in these countries than in Western I countries? I think the behavior goes unchecked more. Well, in certain parts, you probably of the get you know somebody yeah. grabbing you if you yeah. walk the streets of, of Rome. It's not well, unlikely. Well, it, it's it's behavior that's accepted in Rome, but it's certainly not behavior that's accepted in Berlin. Mm. It, it, well, I mean, it, uh, the one thing I'll say is like I grew up in Egypt, as has been said several times on this program. No, but um, <laughs> frankly, you know, in Egypt, the term I think that's uh, for women who have been catcalled in Egypt, including actually, let me just go to it, our very own Shireen Tadros, who used this hashtag. Um, and SH uh, to tweet, I can't remember the first time I was sexually harassed, but the last time was during the Egyptian revolution, the night Mubarakites yeah. stormed Tahrir. So perhaps one of the sounds that she heard, and you know, anyone living in Egypt, perhaps an inside joke is the pssst, 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 because yeah. that's mm -hmm. the way they do it in Egypt. But a lot of people are, are raising the point that you raised, which is Buki Lils is saying, they don't believe the internet presence alone will solve the issue, but breaking the taboo on talking about it sure. is the first step to ending it. And the way in which the taboo is being broken, we didn't get to it in the TV program, but um, as you know, mapping is being used you know, in social media to really illuminate issues that otherwise aren't discussed or that are mm -hmm. taboo, but in this particular interest, in a story, we see qawami harassment, and qawami means mm -hmm. you know, a kind of challenge harassment um, in Arabic, and you see here in Beirut, there's many different um, markers showing places where people have reported being sexually harassed. Lots of activity on the Cornish. Yes, of <laughs> course. Well, that's actually a very famous spot right there for, <laughs> for that and for other uh, things. I'm just going to close out of this. Just saw some profanity, so we'll switch out of that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, doing TV on the live, even online. One other thing I'll just quickly throw in there is Hafsa86 is saying, you know, a lot of people, the whole concept of this is that people are crowdsourcing mm -hmm. where they've been harassed and in what form. Right. They're kind of documenting this. Um, she says, I was harassed walking in the street by a policeman just two weeks ago in an affluent part of Cairo. So she's using this to illuminate the fact that problems run much deeper than just... And there are a lot of, uh, I think there are a lot of misconceptions because what she's pointing to is that it doesn't just happen in the, the sort of poor, run-down areas no, where right. boys are right. you know, uh, very desperate because they don't have any economic opportunities. Let's bring Alex back now because one of the other misconceptions that I want to uh, try and address as well as we hear quite often from, and this ties into our previous topic as well, we hear quite often from women who wear the hijab, they wear the veil. Um, they say that, that they are equally harassed um, as, as women who don't. And in that sense, I think it also it addresses that, uh, that misconception that if you dress in a sexier way, there's a greater likelihood uh, for you to be harassed. From your findings, is it, it consistent with, with what I've just mentioned now? Um, no, I, I completely agree. And as with the person who tweeted saying that it, uh, they experienced harassment in an affluent area, one of the points with the map was to show that this is happening everywhere in Beirut. And, pe and women, no matter how they're dressing or how they're acting, are being targeted by it. Um, and I think to, to, to counter ideas that it has to do with modesty specifically or Islam in some way, but to sort of to show the, fa the fact and clarify the fact that it does have to do with male dominance in society and male dominance over space, which mm -hmm. is a fact throughout the city. Yeah. Have no. you had any uh, male uh, pressure or um, 
uh, male rejection to this campaign uh, that you've thought up? Has anybody insulted <laughs> you? Has anybody said you're, you're wasting your time? Um, I mean, so far, we've, uh, most of the men that have been uh, in contact with it have either been supporters, people who have submitted stories, or people who uh, didn't think about the issue before and then uh, were, were able to learn something or two. So until this point, we haven't really had a negative uh, counter reaction from them. Alex Shems, thank you very much. And I'm glad that uh, we could hear you loud and clear now in the post show. Great to hear your thoughts. Good luck with your uh, campaign. And we will no doubt be following up on uh, oh. your campaign and the way it unfolds. Alex Shems, they're joining us uh, from uh, Beirut there. Uh, final comments on this issue before we move on, Natasha? I love that they're shaming guys into good behavior. <laughs> love it. <laughs> Ahmed? Uh, I won't comment on that, but I really do. I'm always fascinated by the fact that people use maps and these kinds of issues, you know, that all started, many of which on the Ushahidi platform, to really document issues that otherwise would be really complex issues to tackle. Mm -hmm. uh, so using visuals makes it relatable to people you know, who have never been to Beirut, but who can see, as you did very quickly, mm -hmm. oh, it's on the Corniche, there's a, you know, increased number. So if they ever were to go, who knows, it might inform their, their decisions. Just a reminder, you're watching the post show of the stream. And usually there's a guy who's far better looking <laughs> in this particular seat. He's not in the seat, he's actually online. And he's also joining us via Skype from Jerusalem. Derek Ashong is not in the seat, he's in that seat. He's still got uh, the inimitable look and the un uh, what's the word i'm looking for the right adjective to describe your necklace because it's it's a work of art isn't it uh, I just and the head of uh, yeah <laughs> derek ashong's in jerusalem derek tell your uh, adoring fans why you're there uh, well, first of all, Imran, thanks so much for having me, and thanks for stepping in uh, to fill these shoes. You're doing an amazing job. I'm loving today's show. Hi, Ahmed and Natasha. Uh, I'm actually here in Jerusalem learning a little bit more about the nature of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and some of what is being done to try to resolve it. So we've been meeting with leaders in the Israeli side, leaders on the Palestinian side, trying to get deeper into the nuance of what's really going on. And we're going to be attending a conference hosted by Shimon Perez to discuss some of these issues. And, and I understand on Wednesday we're going to be discussing some of this with you and perhaps some guests from uh, Israel and the, the occupied Palestinian territories. Yes, I've been meeting a number of really interesting people and I'm going to Let's see if I can get one person just come to sit with me so that we can have a broader discussion about some of these issues and see if people have a genuine hope for uh, a resolution to the conflict. Okay, Derek, stay where you are. Let's give the viewer a taste of what's coming up tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to be talking to Nizia Ahmed and uh, yeah. you know the proposed almost a, a reversal of media laws potentially. Right. A lot of people are, are scared about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but also related to Tunisia, we've mm -hmm. had news in the past 24 hours, Zain al Abidin bin Ali saying, I was duped. Right. Uh, nobody told me to, to leave the country. They said, just you know, go out for a short while and yeah. you can come back in because your safety is in danger. Right. Any reaction to that online? Yeah, uh, there's lots of reaction. You can follow this story. Uh, you can follow it, but also our viewers. If you're at home on our live blog, you can see uh, what he's been saying. For example, in a statement issued by his lawyers, as you can see here, he said he had agreed to take a plane to Saudi Arabia under the illusion that he would, or not the illusion, under the idea that he would come back and return immediately. Um, one thing that we're seeing that I think is really incredible, which marks um, the use of social media, is the fact that Photos from the actual trial are being shared on YFrog on Twitter. As They've got 18 charges against him. He's right. been tried in absentia. Right. And they're showing all sorts of dosh and goodies from, from the house. From the they? actual trial. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let me show you some of these. These actually surfaced several weeks ago, but people are using them again in their tweets, commenting on uh, what a lot of people are saying is the ridiculous nature of this entire story as it's been playing out like, while he's in absentia. That's nuts. I mean, look at that. That's out of a cartoon. <laughs> stacks and stacks of cash. Right. And I mean, Ben Ali's latest thing that I didn't know I was duped. I mean, what does that say about your <laughs> intellect, your credibility? I don't yeah, know. Some I, of the charges, some of the 18 yeah, charges, I mean, drugs, weapons, and the small matter of con on controlling or holding just a third of uh, the entire country's wealth. Uh, wealth. Let's, uh, Derek, uh, one of the reasons why this is important is there probably wouldn't be a stream. There wouldn't be this show if Tunisia hadn't happened and we hadn't seen this mass spasm of social media and activism in Tunisia and then Egypt and Libya 
and elsewhere. Tunisia is the starting point in, in, a, in a different history, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that the, the show had relevance and people were discussing it prior to that. But what Tunisia did is it codified the power of technology to empower people to make change in their lives. And I think that hopefully what's happening with Ben Ali will put other leaders on notice that if they're committing crimes against their people, ultimately they may very well be held to account. And from our special guest, Natasha, because we've only got about a minute left on the program, final thoughts as you wrap up the post show? Well, I'm just so curious about Jerusalem. I've never been any immediate um, observations, Derek? It's a beautiful place. It's a historic place. It's a very sad place. So many people claim it in the name of God and are willing to uh, work towards that but not work with each other. It's learning a lot, though. Have fun. Forgive me to uh, quickly we'll sidetrack quickly go backwards, it. but we got this tweet in Bashir Omran uh, claiming that the judge has ruled that Ben Ali and his wife would have to pay fines totaling 65.6 million. So we'll be following this story and seeing how events unfold. 65.6 million dollars. That's too yes. low. Yes. Too yeah. low. Probably it's be interesting more. to see how uh, uh, Zainal Abidin Ben Ali receives this news uh, in Saudi Arabia, just outside of Jeddah, isn't he? Precisely. Okay, Derek, thanks a lot for joining us uh, via Skype Absolutely. from Jerusalem. We'll see you on Wednesday. And of course, from next week, you'll be back in the seat and they'll kick me out of this place for all my <laughs> You're welcome uh, anytime, horrible Ibrahim. substitute Thank you. work. Uh, thanks a lot, Derek. <laughs> Natasha, Thank always you. a pleasure. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Absolutely. And Ahmed, great to have you on the show. And uh, you've still got your job. Don't yes, worry. let's hope so. <laughs> thanks a lot for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow for the pre-show here in the stream.